Now that spring's here, I was noting that some of my solar garden lights are not really holding as much of a charge as they could for the sort of bright sunshine there was. And it's not surprising if you consider that these little button cells get a lot of abuse. I mean, basically speaking, they're getting 365 charge and discharge cycles every single year. So, you know, it, a couple of years is pretty much the lifespan of one of these, uh, if that. And also, at the peak of summer, because these cells are designed to accommodate winter and summer with uh, varying performance, particularly in the UK, um, then these cells will actually potentially get quite a high charge because they're only designed for a, a low trickle charge uh, rate. And if the cell's putting out maybe, oh, 30 milliamps or something like that in bright sunshine, it could really be pushing these cells quite hard. So I went online to see if I could get some new cells and found these. Now, this was a typical eBay seller from China called Recycle Powers. I was a bit suspicious about the recycle bit, but all this stuff, all, they all look new. Goodness knows how old they are. I don't know if there's a date code on them. But uh, these are 80 milliamp power cells, and you had the choice of buying one, including shipping for 99p, or 10 for £3.43. So it makes sense to buy sort of a modest number, particularly if you've got a lot of lights that could use them. And these all came wrapped in a piece of foam, and they were all just bunched together like that. And you're thinking, oh, that's that's not good, because, uh, you know, it's a wonder that any of them have a charge at all. And I tested the charge on them and just stuck a meter across them. And it was roughly 1.2 volts each, which is typical for a nickel metal hydride cell. So uh, they've survived the shipping. But I thought it'd be quite good. Uh, I don't like storing these for any length of time, uh, because if you store these cells without a charge, nickel metal hydride cells... Um, if they discharge too low in self-discharge and storage, they can leak. It can cause sort of damage to them, and you get that sort of fluffy electrolyte coming out of them, little crystal of growth. So I thought it would be interesting to make a little charger, and rather than charge one at a time, I thought it would be interesting to get some Molex, Molex connectors and just make an a, a arrangement whereby you could plug them into these conveniently sized uh, connectors, and you could charge five up at once. So this is what I'm going to do, here's the notepad. Push these to the side, make sure I don't short them out again. Not that I could short them out any more than they'd been shorted in their delivery. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try and charge up to five of them at once with just a trickle charge of about 10 milliamps. And to do that, I'm going to take a standard 12 volt supply, 12 volts, zero volts, that's the negative, that's the positive. And I'm going to start off, I'm going to put uh, a LED in series so I can see that the thing's passing current, that the circuit is complete. So it's going to be an LED, and then it's going to go to the first cell. Uh, let's just draw the cells like this. Oh, I'm, I'm already losing track. I, I should have drawn this much simpler, but not to worry. I've started, so I'll continue. I'm trying to represent the fact that they'll each have a wire link between them here. So that's the cells, linked by the little wire links here. Five times, well, it'll be roughly 1.2 to 1.5, depending on their state of charge. And then I'm going to have a resistor down here to limit the current. I could put a diode in series as well, but I'm not going to bother with that. So to work out the resistor, um, I'm going to work it out at... Assume this is a maximum voltage, which is 1.5. So it's going to be 5 times 1.5, which equals 7.5 volts, which is going to be the voltage across the set of cells in series. Uh, the LED, I'm going to use a red one, so it's going to be about 2 volts, which give, gives a total of 9.5 volts. If you deduct that from 12 volts, that's 2.5 volts. Uh, deduct from 12 volts... 12 volts equals 2.5 volts across resistor. So that's going to be 2.5 volts to drop across this resistor here. And to work out the resistor value, I'm aiming for roughly 10 milliamps. Uh, we're going to be using the formula 2.5 volts divided by the current required, 0.01. Uh, comes to 250 ohms. But I'm just going to nudge down in that a little bit. Um, I'm just going to actually write the formula next. That R equals voltage to be dropped 
over the current required R equals V over I. It's always good to just mention that every so often. So I'm going to go for 220 ohms. And the colour of that resistor is red, red, brown, 2, 2, and a 1, 0. 220 ohms. Little quarter watt resistor. It's not going to see, be seeing much of a load. So to make this a bit faster, I've already made my links in bright colours. So I'm going to crimp on a couple of terminals. And uh, I'm going to use this crimping tool for that. This crimping tool is very useful. You don't absolutely need one. You can solder onto the terminals, but I like this crimping tool. It's not a sort of official Molex one. If it was the official Molex uh, crimping tool, it would be just absolutely astronomically expensive. But uh, instead, it's a sort of fairly generic one, but still not cheap. But then again, it is quite a precise piece of machinery, and it takes a bit of getting used to it, but once you get used to it, uh, you can crimp on quite a lot of terminals quite quickly. Still very time-consuming. This is why they have machines that do them in the factories. So I'm going to uh, put the LED maybe about... Well, let's say I crop both these leads then. Little snips. Let's crop that one there, and this one roughly the same length. And these are the positive and negative supply of 12 volts to the charging arrangement. I should mention, to see if these were going to work in the first place, I just shoved one down, the, my LED tester, and I could feel it making contact with the springy contact, so that is uh, going to hold in place. It, it might pop out, but I'll find out once I've done it. I think it's going to make a good connection. It's very low current, so it's not that critical. I've also uh, marked these little Molexi type connectors uh, with black and red for polarity. So now I'm going to solder in the LED and the resistor. So I'm going to put the LED on the red lead. I'm going to strip that. And these are the connectors that are going into the terminals, the little sockets. And these are the ones that are going to the power supply, which is just going to have a, a stripped end, and that's going to be it. It's not going to be anything too sophisticated. I'm just going to put the crocodile clips and the power supply onto this. Having said that, I could put a jack socket onto it, and uh, that would uh, let me just plug it into standard 12-volt supply. And I'm not going to use these things an awful lot. It's just really just to boost the uh, the charge in the cells to keep them fresh. Radio. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to get the LED and I'm going to keep the positive lead down and I'm going to fold the negative lead up and round the side of the LED like this. This is where it would be really helpful to actually zoom in a bit, wouldn't it? That's better. So this is a positive and I'm just going to crop the lead down a bit and I'm actually going to use the helping hands here because this is one of those footry jobs that they are do come in quite handy. So I'm just going to sit that LED into the little grip. These things are just really cheap, the helping hands. They're, you can get them on eBay, you can get them from electronic suppliers. They're very useful. So I'm going to get a bit of solder. I'm going to tin the lead of the LED. I'm going to tin the wire. And then I'm going to flow them together. and actually have the patience to wait for it to cool down before I actually remove it. Now I'm going to uh, solder wire onto the other side. I'm going to crop that lead down. I folded the lead up alongside the LED like this because I intend to put a bit of heat shrink sleeving across this just to cover it. So let's put this into the uh, vise here, the little grip. Apply a little touch of solder onto that lead. And this is the lead that's going from the LED into the connector, so I'm just going to flow some solder onto that. Like this. And have the patience to let it cool before letting go. That's, that's perfect. And to cover that, well, I'll wait. Before I put the heat shrink, I'll put the heat shrink over now. This bit of heat shrink should hopefully be a little bit of a friction fit over that, but just fit over nicely. Or is it going to be too tight? It may be too tight. Let's uh, persist for a while. Oh, that's, that's not working. It's all gone horribly wrong already. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of going. Where's a pair of long nose pliers to pull this out with? Uh, long nose pliers, uh, I was abusing them earlier on. Oh, there they are. They're a wee bit burnt at the end from uh, technical experiments with flames. Possibly a future project, but I don't know about that one. It's uh, maybe a bit controversial, particularly when uh, the world is in a bomb frenzy at the moment. That, that's not working. I've screwed up already, but that's okay. I have no shame. I shall simply cut another little bit of this and I'll just slide it over the lead at the other end. I've obviously, I mean, I slid, slid the LED into this earlier, but uh, the addition of that lead folded up the side, it doesn't seem that much, but it's actually just made it trap the LED. That's annoying. It's kind of spoiling the look, but that's okay. It'll do. Not that it's going to look pretty in the first place. In that case, then, I'll heat shrink this down right now. So I'm going to use the little heat gun for this. I'm going to heat that and shrink it on to the LED and it's just going to protect it from shorting out on anything. Yes, that would have been nicer if it had been a bit shorter and it had fitted, but that's okay. It'll do. Pop that up there. That is so quiet, that little heat gun, I like it. Uh, the resistor. Let's pop the resistor into the grip now and we'll solder the lead on. It doesn't really matter which way around this goes. Uh, resistors are non-polarised components. So I'm going to flood some solder, a little blob onto here. And I'm going to this lead from the negative supplier and it's going to go onto that end of the resistor. I'll crop the lead down first. People are saying, how can you go so close to your fingers with a solder iron? And the answer is, once you've been soldering for a while, you'll find out, because you just get to be aware of its position. It just becomes part of your body. It's just like any tool. A good tool just becomes an extension of your body. Humans are very versatile that way. We're very adaptive. What makes me think, uh, that makes me think of is cherry pickers. It seems like a big complex machine, but once you've been using a cherry picker for a while, it just becomes an extension of your body, really. You just naturally just uh, get the feel for it. I like cherry pickers. They've got absolutely nothing to do with this project, but I just thought I'd mention them. Right, a bit of heat shrink sleeving to go down over this resistor, I think. And then everything should theoretically just plug together after this. So I'm going to slip this heat shrink over here. Slide it down and just gently ease it over that resistor. Like that. Heat shrink's one of these things, as is wire, that you should just get a selection and keep them in stock. It's very handy. Um, as others have said, you don't need to use a hot air gun to heat it. You can use the, you can rub it against the side of the solder iron. I should demonstrate that, shouldn't I? It's a bit late now, but I can do that with a bit of this heat shrink. If you get the solder iron and you just gently rub the, the side of it onto it like that, uh, it will shrink it down too. You can also use a lighter, but the lighter uh, risks actually damaging the uh, the component. So now I'm going to plug the black, the negative side, into the side of the first socket that I've marked. These just can clip in these connectors. And the red is going to go into uh, the socket at the other end, effectively. So I've coloured these roughly in the resistor colour code sequence, red. Then orange is looping out, and it's coming out with the negative and going to the positive of the next connector. Yellow is looping out of the negative. I didn't need to do them in uh, these colours. I could have just made them all the same colour, but I just thought it was nicer. It doesn't really add any great amount of time to the doing it. Red, orange, yellow, green. And that's going from the black into the red to connect them in series. And then blue, coming out the negative, going into the positive. 
and then of course it comes out the negative and goes to the power supply. So let's uh, plug some batteries into this now and actually see if this does actually work. So the positive is marked in these. It's, they've got a curved side which is the negative and the positive side is a flat side and it's got a plus symbol on it. So that's going to push in there. They might need nudged about just to make them uh, make a good connection. I'm not really sure yet. It's not really. The connector isn't really designed to interface the batteries in this way. I'm just improvising. Oop, that was trying to escape. Maybe uh, trying to do five at once was just greed, but then again, nothing wrong with a little bit of greed. I also have to be careful they don't short together. And the last battery. Okay, so if this works, and it might not work, if I turn my power supply on here, and I set it to 12 volts, let's nudge this up to 12 volts here, and then I connect the black to here, and the red to here, then this LED should light the red LED has lit the current showing in the bench power supply is actually 16 milliamps at the moment, which is fine because it means the uh, battery voltage is uh, sort of low. But as soon as it comes up higher, uh, the current will go down to about 10 milliamps. Uh, the LED is flickering there because one of these isn't making quite a connection. And now I'm just going to leave that for a while to top them up. And that's fundamentally, zooming back out, that's fundamentally it. Uh, just a little improvised five cell charger that will trickle charge these button cells at about 10 milliamps. And then once these ones have had maybe about an hour, then I'll put these other ones on as well. And uh, that will just make them perfect for storage. And after that, I'll get some little individual bags, uh, little individual plastic bags like this one and just bag them up individually uh, ready for use when I put them into lights. So yeah, that's a good result. That's uh, working very well. I'd just like to add one small bit of information to this video. One of the advantages of nickel metal hydride cells is that the charging circuitry for them is incredibly simple. You can keep trickle charging them all the time without causing harm as long as you don't exceed a significant current. Uh, say for instance, these ones I'd happily trickle charge them at about up to 10 milliamps, but ideally in something like say a time switch, let me find a time switch that might use them, then you'd just trickle charge it at something like 1 milliamp. It, it wouldn't have to be that high. Um, because these things very rarely have to depend on the battery, which is just as well because these ones are particularly crap. However, uh, so these things, don't, you don't have to cut off the charge when you reach a voltage, as you'd have to do if you were using a lithium cell, this swollen lithium cell, which is quite interesting. That's why it's here. Uh, so this typical circuit in a solar light is to have the uh, solar panel and just basically a diode and then the rechargeable cell. That is pretty much the charging circuit, uh, nickel metal hydride, and that's all that's involved with the circuitry to actually then convert the voltage up and detect when the uh, the solar panel stopped out putting voltage or current, should I say, because uh, it's night time. So that is as much circuitry as is needed. It keeps things very, very simple. And that's what that circuitry there is based on. Um, anything worth adding beyond that? Yes. I wanted to try and check the capacity of these. So I sorted a couple of leads onto this one. And I made an adapter and I put it into a standard smart charger and I set the current to the lowest, 100 milliamp discharge, 200 milliamp charge. It was far too high. As soon as it tried to discharge it, the internal impedance of the cell limited the current so much that it, the voltage dropped enough that it thought it had fully discharged it. And as soon as it switched to charge, uh, again, the internal impedance, the internal resistance of the cell was so high that even at 200 milliamps, the voltage shot up so quickly that it just instantly terminated the charge. So I couldn't actually determine the capacity of these. Uh, the easiest way to do that is ultimately to charge one up fully and then try it in a solar light, maybe. But yes, uh, so that is working. The little red LED is glowing. They're charging at about uh, 10 to 12 milliamps at the moment. So, um, yep, yeah, that's, uh, that's a good result.